welcome to Two Guys and Some Horror. In this week's episode, Clark keeps screaming, Turn it off! While I'm too busy trying to figure out what the hell that guy's name is so we can get rid of him. We watched Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, and Rumpelstiltskin. Oh, howdy, howdy, howdy. How's it going? It's going good. Good. It's a good day. It's a good day to record. I think everything's going well. Good. So, um, I picked these movies. I hope that you uh, didn't have a bad time with both of them. But uh, but let's start with Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Um, first Halloween film without Michael Myers. And probably the last one that won't have Michael Myers in it. Uh, right. What you what you think about it, man? Like, just lay lay out your honest opinion. Give me, give me your opinion. Uh, it felt like just a Halloween one shot story, which uh, I don't know. Like when you, you t- I was I was kind of connecting it at first. I was like, oh, this can connect to Michael Myers. This can connect to why he's he's killing, why all this stuff's going on. Because at first I thought everyone was like being mind controlled, and then it. What turned out to be what it was, I was like, oh, oh, okay. So it's just kind of not related at all. Yeah, that's um, probably one of the biggest things I realized. um, Because I, I, uh, so I remember as a kid watching Halloween for sure a lot. But I don't really remember watching a lot of the sequels, um, especially knowing which ones they were when I was younger. I just, if it was on TV, you know, AMC or whatever, they had it on. And then... um, I don't know, it's probably like 19 or 20 and I bought the the box set and I hit one, I hit two, I hit three and I was like, what the hell did I just watch? Like, this doesn't remind me at all of Halloween. What is this? So I did some research um, and got more of the backstory and understanding of what John Carpenter was uh, trying to do after a while. But um, yeah, it was pretty funny because you and I had that same conversation, right? Like you thought it was just another Michael Myers film, right? Right, dude. Yeah, that's it's uh it's pretty tricky because it's right it's I mean it's not like it's in the middle of the films because there's a very long um I don't know storyline that that they've got going here. I mean they have ten films now. Um, not all of them are interconnected. Some of the you know some of the storyline stuff like that's been removed. Um, they just did the reboot quite recently. Um, Rom Zombie's done his take on it. Right, they did uh, where he was... Uh, the Rob Zombie movie, that was where he was just some uh, country bumpkin, right? Yeah, basically. Troubled you know, troubled youth, uh, picked on, abused, uh, bad family home kind of thing. And then, um, you know, finally just one day has enough and snaps and, and takes care of business and fights back realistically. Yeah. Um. It's. I mean, he's still a psychopath. Don't get me wrong, but right, you could definitely tell like what made him become that way. Right, contributed for sure. So the first the first Halloween movie was directed by John Carpenter. Uh, it was written by John Carpenter, and then uh, Halloween Two was actually written by John Carpenter as well, but it was directed by Rick Rosenthal. So I think these these were part of the plan. The first two movies were like, all right, we have Michael Myers. And they're like, well, Michael Myers is dead, so kind of what do we do? Uh, this is kind of hearsay, or me just kind of guessing around. And so uh, I guess John Carpenter was like, well, we'll make something new. We'll make a new anthology. And the trivia here says uh, he tried to make something. Uh, he was thinking about, hey, I'm making a new Halloween anthology movie every year. And since it kind of bombed at the box office, they just – went back to Michael Myers. Yep. Um, you know, they, they were probably like, Hey, we, we're not making any money off this. Uh, we can't just keep giving you money to make movies that are going to bomb. And horror films in the eighties are pretty, I think like most people who talk about horror nowadays, they either go back to the eighties, um, or they go back to like that very small sliver of nineties horror. Um, there isn't a large gap or there's a very large gap between the eighties that we love for horror films. And then the small sliver in the nineties, and then you're going to have hit or miss pockets. But the eighties is a very large chunk of just good, um, highly sought after, highly talked about horror films. It's just the VHS era was pretty big there. I think for a lot of us who like horror. 
Hmm. The first note that I have is is uh, the great 80s intro. Um, that synth with the uh, green, green on green, like pixelated terminal kind of look. Right. Um, zooms out and then makes that beautiful um, jack-o'-lantern head <laughs> or jack-o'-lantern, which I thought was really cool. Um, and yeah, so like let's... Let's now break apart and kind of dive a little bit into the to the story, um, into some of these characters because I think this movie is a really fun one to kind of break apart and talk about. And um, the first person you meet is Harry, um, mm-hmm. who's kind of running away from uh, this guy in a suit, and the guy in the suit is just nonstop coming after him. And you don't really see the guy; he's not running, he's not moving quickly. He's very Michael Myers esque in that stalking sense um yeah and then so he kind of has a fight with him battles him whatever um and that's that's really the first taste of the villain in this film that you get to see so there's there are these really snazzy business suit wearing men um they seem unstoppable they just keep coming after you and it ends up he ends up getting put in the hospital um skipping some of the details there just to avoid uh, any kind of spoilers that you may be worried about or whatnot. I mean, this film's from 1982, <laughs> so. Well, the scene where he's, you know, where he's trying to get away, and he su- he successfully escapes from one of them, kind of showcases a little bit of how these guys work and what their, uh, whether or not they show like any pain or anything. That was a uh, pretty interesting. So, like it, going back after seeing it the first time, we'd be like, oh, okay, so that makes sense now. Exactly. Good. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. The um, so he runs to the gas station right to get help, um, and the guy um, because he's he's kind he's not like so the the gas station attendant he's not like a super important character but he's definitely uh he's throughout he's at the beginning he's at the end, um. So, I mean, he's not super important because he's not he's someone. Go ahead. Yeah. He's someone the audience can feel safe with. Uh, I believe that that was why they kind of brought him back at the end. It's just uh, this guy shows up. He, he saves this guy, he brings him to the hospital. And then at the end, there's like the one of the characters is there again. And it's kind of like, oh, they're, he, they're in the safety of this character's home. And this character is a relatively good human being because he says, my mama taught me to when someone's in need needs help you help them so i felt like it was a yeah good choice to do that yeah um so he takes harry to the hospital drops him off has that conversation and while you're so this is kind of just a fun fact for you when you're watching this the next time you watch it when when they drop off harry at the hospital uh there's a news report going on about stone stonehenge missing right and then right after that uh, news clip is the Silver Shamrock song, like right after it. And I, mm-hmm. I always, I always ignore that. I thought that was nothing. You know, there's, I've never realized uh, any kind of connection there. But after seeing the movie now for probably like the twentieth time, there's a little bit of connection there. And I may be, I may be like reaching for something that's not really there. They didn't do anything specific with it, but just kind of well, funny. Like- you could connect like the ending sort of to Stonehenge because there's the uh, there's that weird magic stuff going on. It's called Season of the Witch. Just kind of expect some sort of witchcraft, but uh, I don't know. I think it just might be very loosely connected. Well, so that stone is definitely the stone stolen from Stonehenge, and it harnesses Celtic energy. Mm-hmm. Um, so jumping forward a little bit, Colin Co- Cochran. Um, the owner of Silver Sam- Shamrock is a uh, Irish descent man who dabbles in witchcraft. Um, that is that is the villain. There you go. In case you were curious, in case you were wondering, there you go. That's that's who we're up against here. And who's our hero? This is the doctor. It's Tom Atkins. <laughs> It's always Tom Atkins. It's always Tom Atkins. So his name in the film is Daniel, um, but I'm probably going to call him Tom Atkins or just Tom way more often than not in my notes because um, he's in a lot of um, 
he's in quite a few John Carpenter films, and he's always the hero, uh, which is what I love. He plays a really good hero in the 80s. But, um, but yeah, so we're introduced to Tom at the hospital and all that. Um, yeah, I mean, I got a, I got some notes here. I don't want to just, like, fly through them, but I definitely just want to kind of discuss the movie from a just a pure standpoint and talk about what we liked throughout it and what we didn't like. So for me, some of the things that I really enjoyed throughout the film is that Halloween time feel. You feel like it's mm-hmm. fall. You feel um, kind of the that crisp air, I'd say. Um, everyone looks a little chilly, uh, so they're always wearing jackets. And so it's not like they filmed it incorrectly or at the wrong time or anything like that. I feel like they did a really good job with what they picked for time to film. Right. I also love Tom's character in this movie, just in general. He seems like the total, um, kind of like badass. uh, I'm a swinging dick kind of guy. Like definitely he's trying, he's trying to work things out with his wife, right? You could clearly tell well with the kids. So he's trying to work things out with the wife to, I think have his kids be in a happy home. And that way the kids don't think anything's wrong. But as soon as he leaves, He's right back to chase and tail. Yes. Yes. So, well, even if his wife's not around, he's chase and tail. He's hitting on everyone in the movie. Every female character. He, he makes out with the, the character who dies at the very beginning of the film. He, he goes out, he, he sleeps with his daughter. Uh, I don't even know. I'm a little concerned on, on the workings of that spoilers. Uh, no, we're going to talk about it. We're not going to, no, I don't care because that is a, critical piece that uh we can dissect and we are not i i don't care we're gonna spoil the shit out of that okay so this uh this guy the guy who dies his daughter or so so we think she is ellie i think's her name she shows up at the hospital or not the hospital she shows up to uh tom atkins the bar and at the bar they meet each other they talk he and she kind of joins him and at some point in the film we find out that either she or Maybe she's dead, but there is a there's a doll that looks exactly like her. Whether or not it is her, I can't I can't tell. I don't know. Uh, but anyhow, like she she can talk. She does everything quite normally, except to, to like a certain point where the uh, I think the the effects for that were really well done. Like I'll give you I'll give them props for that. Like when he knocks off the the head of this doll. And uh, it's kind of, it's very interesting. But yeah, Tom is definitely cheating on his wife. He's definitely, she, they're not married anymore. She's she's annoyed by him. She's got the, uh, I don't want to put up with your shit attitude with him. She's tired of him. He's hitting on all these doctors, these nurses. He sleeps with almost every female character he comes across in the movie. Yep. He, he smacks the ass of one of the nurses he works with. Like, it's just. And that's even better because she's like. Tom, you're married, like, or Daniel, you know, inappropriate kind of a thing. And he just totally, like, brushes it off, like, nah, like, it's cool, babe. I can do whatever I want. I'm a grown-ass man. And it's like, no, dude, that's not cool. So, like, what's funny, I like this character so much because uh, I think it's true to, and this might sound terrible, but I think it's true to, like, 80s men um, back in the day um, where they thought they were untouchable a lot of times, especially as they got higher into power. So you've Mm -hmm. got Tom Atkins, who's playing this really good doctor. Clearly everyone at the hospital loves him. Um, He's smacking nurses asses and they're not running and telling their bosses on him for whatever reason. Um, And, and still this is the guy you're supposed to root for throughout the entire movie. It just blows my mind that that's uh, that that was what was cool back then. I wouldn't even call that cool. The guy was just kind of a chode. Uh, I didn't like him. I did not like him. He was trying to do right, but at the same time, it was just... Do you think he was only doing right because he thought that that would score more chicks? I don't know. I don't think so. I think he was doing what he felt was right. He was kind of a... He was the uh, the renegade character, the Dirty Harry kind of the thing that men were aspiring to be back at that time frame. I, I wouldn't call him a hero. I wouldn't call him a villain. I'd just call him some guy at the the wrong place at the wrong time on purpose. That's a pretty good, yeah, that's a pretty good way to describe it. Wrong place, wrong time. Because, I mean, the whole, the whole reason why he gets dragged in is because Harry gets his eyeballs crushed through 
in his hospital. That's the only reason right. why Daniel's character even gets involved. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to put it. Something which, he never seen happen before. Something that he wanted to to really dig into. Which he's not a cop. He's not. It wasn't his responsibility. <laughs> I use the word investigate uh, with them because okay, so just we'll rewind two seconds. So Harry gets killed in the hospital uh, by one of those uh, Irish well dressed men, and the way they kill him, it's the most gnarliest kill in the movie to me. Um, the dude takes his two thumbs, wraps around Harry's head pushes his thumbs directly into the guy's eyeball sockets and then squeezes so hard it pops like the bone from right. your forehead to your nose whatever that bone is called he squeezes around it and breaks that out crushes his skull and hemorrhages his brain basically renders yeah. him dead that was it his eyes are bleeding his blood's coming out of his nose dude did you see uh, the ooze the weird ooze <laughs> The, the orange goop that comes out of their mouths? No, that came out of Harry because of, I think, uh, how hard the... the What are we going to call them? we got to have the name for them. Like robotic something? Like just robots? Cause well, what, the guy, whoever Cochran, like he made he made dolls, like lifelike robotic dolls. And he was like, the internal parts were the easy part, which I'm assuming making them look and sound human was probably the hard. Yeah. But... But what the hell are we going to call I, I just want to have a good name for them for future references whenever we watch other stuff and may come know. back to it. I don't know. We'll come up with something cool. They're basically dolls. But yeah, these creepy-ass dolls. Um, dolls is probably the, the best way to put it because he plays with them. They're basically his toys, uh, Cochran's toys. Yeah. So yeah, I like that. We'll go with that. Um, so this doll um, kills Harry, and then... Um, Tom Atkins tries to stop him as he's walking out, and he goes straight to the car and just blows himself up. The just doll pours gasoline all over himself yeah. and lights himself on fire in the car, and kaboom. And that's that's what drags Tom Atkins into this whole scenario. So he's at the yeah. bar, he's drinking, thinking about this, contemplating like, what what should I do? What the hell happened? I don't even know what's going on right now. And then Ellie walks into the bar, starts questioning him doesn't get any real answers from him but then that makes him question things even more because she's like what is she talking about um and then decides to partner up with her and they become investigators trying to figure out what the hell is going on um right. and uh at the same time so while he's in the bar this is a fun note uh they play the trailer for the original halloween film um in the bar because it's around halloween i thought that was a cool John Carpenter moved to put his own stuff in his own movie. And, um, yeah, so that's when we get met with the comment or the quote, uh, Irish Halloween mass in California. So <laughs> I kind of have yeah. that same weird feeling like why out of all places, Cochran, why would you pick California to make these masks? But Hey, I don't know. Two more days till Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. Anyhow. Uh, <laughs> so then, yeah, uh, Anything's ahead, possible yeah. in California. That was one of the lines he said. He's like, hey, it's California, as if it's like, yeah, anything goes here. So they travel, uh, they travel, basically they're making their way to the, to the factory, to Silver Shamrock Factory. And uh, it's getting late, so they decide to stop over at a motel for the evening. Yeah. Um, some annoying family shows up, like the, the best salesman in Pasadena. Or whatever it was. Yep. Um, annoying little shit of a kid. And then, and then here we yep. go. Here's here's Tom Kids. Atkins. Mom's like, don't don't try, don't ride your bike in the road. Kid just flips her off. Yep. No respect. And then the uh, lady. So Tom Atkins goes does some digging, some investigating, whatever. Finds out that sure enough, Harry had been there quite recently. Um, mm -hmm. And then he goes back to the room, and they start having a conversation. And then she asks him. Where do you want to sleep? It's like, come on, man. Like, you're He's like, really... isn't it obvious? And then he just starts making out with her. So is she a doll at this point, you think? I don't know. That's that's what I question. Yeah. I would say, in terms of the movie, yeah, sure, whatever. Just, I don't... just assume she is. I don't think so. But yet. I don't... I don't think so yet, personally. You know... I'll tell I you, don't... when we get there, I'll tell you when I think the switch happened. I don't even know if there was a switch, to be quite honest. I don't know... I don't know what to think. I don't know what the intent was, but what I can tell you is, was it before or after when he meets the homeless guy? 
I think it was before, because he goes out drinking. So when he goes out drinking is when he runs into the hobo guy. Yeah, which I think is... That happens before they start diddling, right? Correct, yeah. So my notes go, yeah. the hobo talk shit gets killed, and then <laughs> Tommy Boy lays the, the wood. <laughs> I want to yeah, go back yeah. to the hobo, because yeah, yeah. This, this hobo is essentially shitting on, on the factory. He's like, they won't hire me, I can't get a job. And, and he was born and raised gives, there. He gives exposition on the factory, how it was brought into the town, how everything kind of started here. Oh, and good he call out, yeah. Owner. He yeah. points to the camera as he's like, this guy is doing this. So a lot of the, it's a good way, he gives most of the uh, kind of understanding of how things sort of were set up in this town now that this, this town is completely controlled by this Cochran fellow. And when the main character leaves, the suits show up and... This is probably the best death scene, and well, second best death death scene in the entire movie, because they just squeeze his head and just like a grape. Hey, pops Cochran, up. fuck you! That's what he says to him. Like he looks at the camera, yeah. and then these guys show up. The robot or the dolls show up not too long after. Yeah. It, was, it was great. So you yeah. liked this kill better than uh, Harry's kill in the hospital? I would say this one looked better. Nice. In cool. terms of like the way the pop worked, it was the second one, but this one it was a bit stronger. <laughs> Instead okay. of them like rubbing their hands on on the drapes and then lighting themselves on fire, <laughs> I feel like this this made a bit more logical sense. But second best kill happens while Tom is making love to Ellie. That's the one and I think is visually probably my favorite in this movie. Visually, let's talk about it. Yeah. So hold on before we get there because right before that happens, so Tommy's laying the wood right, and then. They they stop, and then they hear some weird noises, right? And is that is that when she gets it? Was that when she dies, or is it? Because I have a quote here, and I don't. It comes before or after, but either way, it's it's a. Well, pretty they're f- making out. She's like, "What was that?" And he's like, "Who cares?" Yes, and then she's wanting was... more. She wants second time. This is they're going for round two, and he goes, "Wait, wait, wait! How old are you?" I'm like, "Dude, too late! You already fucked her. Like, you you already had sex once." Why are you asking yeah. now how old she is? And you're still going to have sex with her again because that's just your that's your bad nature of your character. That's yeah, no. Anyways, let's let's just get to the cool lady. So, the bitchy lady who was complaining about, "Oh my god, they screwed up my order again. I have to be here, you know, again." Like she's just she's complaining about Cochran so hard when she shows up. She takes a hairpin out of the back of her hair and she fiddles with one of the uh the little tags on the masks and there's a microchip in the back and does she notice it she well she it falls off she doesn't notice it at first then she's reading her book while they're they're having sex the other characters are having sex in the other room and that's when she starts poking it and then she breaks a piece of it off and that the light effects kind of happen and that's when there's a chip yeah and that's when you see what these masks actually do Yep. So, um, the mask has some creepy ass shit come out of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then basically, I mean, the best way to describe it is it melts her face. Like snakes, s- crickets, spiders, cockroaches, beetles. Yeah. yeah. Ugh. And her face turns like the way I describe it is it looks like a pumpkin after it's kind of um, yeah. aged for a while, and then rots and folds in on itself that's what her face that's what it reminds me of her face does that right oh definitely made me like ugh. the masks also kind of look a little gross after the stuff happens yep it's gnarly well then the then the cochran boys show up and they take her to the finest hospital that Cochrane can offer. The factory. It's basically the factory. They're, the factory they're, has the best medical facilities. They're going to turn her into a doll. I think they just kill her. Or they just get rid of the body. There's no reason not to. Let me ask you this, though. What if he could turn her into a, to a doll, send her back to wherever she works at, and then now she is one of his spies working in another facility? But why would he do that when it's almost Halloween and the commercial airs and everyone who's nearby is sacrificed? 
Because that, that, that dead body is going to come back to burn him, right? What? Like that missing, her being missing? Not, gonna necess go, not, necessarily. not necessarily, because uh, once that final commercial airs, well, kind of spoiling things right here, but anyhow, these masks are, this microchip's connected to, to the commercials, and on Halloween at 9 p.m., this commercial's supposed to go off and do whatever did happen to this lady to everyone. So I, I, my thinking was, well, you see the parents were in there too, right? With their kid. Mm -hmm. Like when they showed that commercial to kind of show what it does. Yeah, you're talking about when they're on the tour? No, when they're locked in the room. Yeah, remember? When they're locked in the room, they see the final commercial. Mm -hmm. And they weren't wearing masks, but they both die as well. Yeah. They show like snakes and stuff coming out of the mom's. I wonder here. if it's a proximity thing to the chip, right? It's got to be. It could, it could be. Yeah, because they, so just to get through that real quick, so they get, they go on the tour, they all are there, that family, the best salesman, right? And then uh, Tom Atkins and Ellie, they were there to just ask if her father had been seen and all that jazz. Um, and then Cochran's like, you know what? You're missing shipment. We'll take care of it on us. No problem. And everyone's like congratulating him and cheering him and telling everyone how awesome Cochran is. And then they... They decide to go on the tour because he invites them. And as they're going through the tour, uh, they're seeing these different, like, I don't know how to describe it really, other than, like, trade secrets is what he keeps calling them throughout, where there's certain areas they can't go. And that's basically a sign that something shady is going on, right? That's got to be. So, let's see. Yeah. A little uh, interesting piece of trivia. Remember the curfew at 6 o'clock? The voice for that was Jamie Lee Curtis. Really? Yeah. That is interesting. Let me throw one back at you. So that crazy bitchy lady, um, that's mm -hmm. Tom Atkins' wife at the time in the film. So the that's his, the the oh. one who gets the in the other hotel room. So while he's banging that young chick in the other room, that's his real wife acting next door. <laughs> Ironically oh. enough. She has aged wonderfully, especially after she poked that chip. Well, Let me no, just say. They're no longer together anymore, but. Well, isn't he? Uh, I believe that. Especially if he is any way, if he's any way outside of the film that he is in the film, there's no way that relationship lasts. Right. There's no way. Well, the, uh, there's another piece of trivia. So the, his wife, the lady who played his wife, was actually expecting the child of the, the director at the time. What? Yeah. No, I don't I don't have another one. Wallace. You just you just one up to me. <laughs> I don't I don't have another one. You got me. That was it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Damn it. All right, you win this round, Clark. Uh yeah, so then after all that tour stuff, they see grand or grandpa. They see dad's car in the garage. Mm -hmm. And and all the dolls kind of formulate and block her from getting to the car. And they're making a big scene and all that jazz. And right. then, so they leave, and when they leave, that's when that family goes in the room, uh, the waiting room, whatever it is, to see the commercial, and then they all get it. That kid, by the way, who plays uh, Little Buddy is his actual name in the movie. Um, this is his only, like, thing that he's really known for. If you look him up on IMDb, it's the picture of him melting his face <laughs> in the room that's his imtp picture because it's all he's that's done that's a good picture that's it's pretty good it's gnarly Ugh. Uh, so yeah so they go back to the the ho they go back to the motel or whatever and then this is where um i think ellie gets kidnapped so right here is where i have a note she's now an android she's a robot um i think this is where it happens so when tom leaves and then ellie gets abducted by the the other robots this is where i think cochran makes the switch but the other theory is she was already an android the entire time right and this was cochran just trying to find out how much tom atkins character knows so that way he knows whether he needs to just kill him or leave him alone because he doesn't know anything or whatever it might be hmm um yeah because tom goes now Tom's trying to find Ellie, 
right, in the factory, and he comes across the creepy knitting grandmother. Yeah. And he shakes her and he says, where is he? And her head falls off, and then you can see the inner workings of all of the the cogwheels and actuators and everything inside of her. Then Tom kicks the shit out of one of the robots. Um, gosh, that was pretty gnarly too, wasn't it? Yeah. He punches him in the gut and when he pull he like so deep and then when he pulls his hand out it's just covered in goop. Yeah, that was goofy. It was the moment when you know Tom finally realizes that they're not people. That was that was the moment. He had no like they didn't really have any idea up until right there. Um Right. Which I thought was pretty pretty good. I mean, it's a pretty good reveal for the character to find out in such a uh like tense moment. Because right after yeah. he kills the one, two more come in and basically take him as a prisoner. And the butterscotch pudding. I mean, probably tasted good. The stuff coming out of their mouths and his chest, that was like that had to be some sort of pudding. The, yeah, yeah, my daughter just got this um like this slime kit, do it yourself slime kit or whatever. And it that's what it reminds me of. It looks like that kind of slime weird um I don't even know how to uh, like jello ish looking kind of thing, but the stuff in the movie is definitely thicker. Like more of like a pudding, like you're saying. So it's like a mixture between those two uh consistencies maybe. Ugh. I should take a picture with the slime on my face and post it on our Twitter. <laughs> two guys horror pod. Check us out. Um, let's see. So I've got a note here. Cochran's secret. I don't know why I wrote that. I think I was just tired of hearing Cochran so much. Um, it seems like they emphasize cock a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's really without getting too much into the end of it, because I don't want to. We don't like to talk about the end spoilery too much. We, you know, I don't mind talking about spoilers throughout. Because maybe it'll hook you and make you want to watch it as a viewer or as a listener. You know, you might get hooked. But I won't tell you the big twists, other uh, the later big twists. We already talked about Ellie. Um, oh, dude, when he's tied up in that room and gets out, what do you yeah. think the chances are that he makes that mask over the camera again? So I actually looked into that. <laughs> so he he made it the first time in, on a practice run. And then after that, it took him like 40, ch- 40 tries. Jesus Christ. Okay, so uh, just to describe the scene for the listeners, he's tied up basically in this chair, and they've got a mask on his head. And it's the countdown to the big commercial, to when everyone's going to you know, see this commercial for the first time or whatever in the facility. So this is when the family's in the room, and he's in the room, and um, you know he's freaking out. He's got to get this mask off his head. He At this point, he understands something gnarly is going to happen. So... Uh, he some he gets his knife or whatever. He cuts the rope and gets out and then uh, takes the mask and there's a camera up in the corner of the room and he flings this mask and it lands perfectly covering the camera. I, I mean, it's like one in a million. Clearly, it's one in a 40. So that's, that's our official number. It's one in a 40 and he makes it. Um, Yeah. And then my last note... My my last note is the the reason why I love this movie so much is I watched it as um, you know as a kid didn't even understand what was going on then I finally watched it later on realized what it really was something completely different than your Michael Myers and there's these sunset shots these silhouettes they do um, and I absolutely love those shots that they did because that like right now when I'm outside walking around you know it's October twentieth. Um, and that's exactly what our sunsets look like. It's that, it's that beautiful faded sky. You've got the, the blues to the oranges to the pinkish, you know, and then the sunset dark and it's just gorgeous. It's, this is the time of year that I love here. And those sunsets are in that movie. And I'll always remember Arizona sunsets in the fall. That's exactly what they are. So yeah, that's my, my final note. I love this movie. You already know that. I don't need to tell you my rating what do you think man i would say it's it's worth watching once i i don't have the same amount of love for it that you do i would have to say that the i I like mike myers more and i feel that this should have been its own movie 
I, nice. I can agree 100% with you on that. I, I feel like this should not be a part of the Halloween series. It shouldn't have that name. It doesn't need yeah. that name. It's its own thing, for sure. The Halloween series is now so messed up that you don't know what to believe or what to watch, really. Uh, if you want to watch the Michael Myers saga, it's one, two, four, five, six, and I believe H2O. Or you could go one, the remake, the reboot, and then the next two movies that are coming soon. Or you could watch the re- remake, which was made by Rob Zombie. So it's it's all a little confusing. And it's um, uh, so just to talk about that for a little bit. Um, I think they're giving us more ways to watch Michael Myers slash Halloween. Um, Because if you think about it, now you have a couple different takes on Myers. You have the Rob Zombie, super gruesome, gory. um, I don't really care what you think. I'm going to show this to you anyways kind of films, which I think are good in their own standalone way. Do I love those movies? No. Do I think they're shit? No. I think they're good. They're definitely good. I've watched them more than once. Um, I think they're good. Then you have, like you said, (laughs) you have the one, two, four, five, six, um, seven, and no, one, two, four, five, six, and then H two O, and don't count Resurrection. And then, (laughs) you know, you have have not seen Resurrection. I have not seen. Uh, I have not seen four or five or six. So, and I haven't seen the uh, the remake. Spoiler alert: You will see some of those soon. Not well, not soon, but Uh, you will. (laughs) As long as this podcast is alive, yeah. Eventually, I would assume like next Halloween we'll we'll go back to more Halloween movies. But I think maybe even before then. I I think there's one that is kind of themed in the summer that you might get, but we'll see. See. There's one coming out soon, so we might watch that when it's in theaters. Oh we'll my see god! About that. Yes. Uh, anyhow, well, we've been talking about this movie for almost 45 minutes. We probably yeah. should cut this one. Time, time to move on. Yeah. So we're gonna head to the 1995 film, um, Rumpelstiltskin. Okay. And Can I? I just want you to go. I just want you to talk. Just tell me. I... Lay it out there. I okay, so I don't like this is a lifetime original movie. The way this movie is kind of portrayed, the way the acting works, this is like a strong working woman whose husband just passed away, who's a single mom, trying to find love in the the big city, and her big sassy friend who can't hold a boyfriend. They just talk and drink wine, and their psychologist friend comes over, and she just kind of happens to be chased by a little hunchback named Rumple Stiltskin trying to steal our baby. Fantastic. You know, I would make a drinking game of this movie. Every time you hear something that you think would be, be heard at a Renaissance fair, fair, you take a drink. Just out of context, kind of one of the old-timey com- comments that make absolutely no sense. Like, what did you think of... <laughs> or That's one of my favorites. <laughs> or... Must have taken a great many blacksmiths to build that, I imagine. Give me the goddamn baby. Make another one. <laughs> I want your steed. <laughs> oh, my God. But then you had such, like, 90s um, comments like, you are a poop monster, aren't you? When they're talking to the kid. Like, the yeah. moms even have pretty terrible lines. Um, oh, man. It was... It was definitely a Lifetime original movie. The people that directed this movie were actually the creators of Scooby-Doo. What? Yeah. Wow. The the creators of of Scooby-Doo, the original creators of Scooby-Doo, produced this film. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) They're the ones who also did Demonic Toys, aren't they? I don't know. Maybe. I Uh, haven't seen it. Yeah. But anyhow, like the very beginning of this movie where he pulls out the guy's eyeball and he, he eats it and he starts smacking his lips. He goes, like, I just, I couldn't hold laughter in. It's just so ridiculous. <sighs> what do you think of the uh, character concept for Rumpelstiltskin? Because I, as a kid, thought it was horrific watching it now. I'm like, meh, like, it's good. It's good makeup. But, you know, an adult's not frightened of this. Like, a uh, so I guess I'm comparing it to like, I'm 30 years old now. I'm looking at this. I'm not scared of it. But I watched Pennywise and the new It, and I'm like, that's pretty fucking terrifying in yeah. comparison. 
Um, so what do you think of Rump in in today's I, day? So the statue, the effects when he was a statue and his head turns and he looks at the statue of her, her picture of her dead husband. That was great. The character, the guy who acted as him trying to do the, uh, so what, Warwick Davis's uh, leprechaun character. Mm -hmm. he, he tried too hard and just didn't work for him. They needed a better actor. They needed to, I don't know. Like the, the makeup was fine, but the actor was terrible. <laughs> just yeah. what I needed another bad habit okay all right let's see oh yeah um go ahead the early the early 90s like the so there's a cop the very beginning of the film they, this guy was partners driving he's, he's playing rap music and the guy's like you really like this and the guy looks and he's like I may be a cop but I'm cool yeah <laughs> This, is, this movie's a cringe fest. Like, it's... there's a slow motion scene. It's a, uh, like, you could tell someone's going to die there. Yeah. Very, very much so. Yeah, and then there's a, uh, there, there are a couple things I want to want to talk about. But, uh, so after her husband dies, you know that guy who who shows up later in the film, the host, the TV show guy. Yeah, Max. He's basically Jerry Springer. Yeah, and he goes in and in a show like it starts out. He's like, which one of you topless dancers was the first to lose their virginity? I guess it would be the slowest runner. And it's just. Are you insinuating rape? Yeah, like, things... he's oh, God. So this cringy, <laughs> just cringy Ugh. jokes like that would not fly today no, at all. He, he's bad, man. There's never been a baby in my truck. Like, really, dude? Nobody cares. <laughs> It's very, very much like they very much want to play this guy off as an asshole, and then they turn him into a hero at the end of the movie. Really? And, uh, I, I still didn't get the hero feeling, but I mean, I he was just well, there. It's kind of like shtick. Tom. He, he's like Tom's character in a way. He's like, you yeah. know, wrong place, wrong time. He's stuck now, and he just feels like he's doing the right thing. I well, he I becomes a hero when he tries to have a fake baby. <laughs> yeah, the fucking the, whole... the dirt buggy. You'd think, okay, so Rumpelstiltskin knows where the baby is no matter what. You'd think he know that the guy didn't have the baby. Suspension no. of disbelief broken right there. Because well, Suspension of disbelief was broken when he jumped out the window because he did a bunch of cartoon transportation. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he always knows where the baby is. Like, when, he, when she went to her best friend's house, he knew. Yeah. He knew she wasn't home anymore. It's not like he, like followed her there he just knew because he knows but he no. was in a truck and he found her <sighs> yeah she was in the middle of nowhere oh man i smell um, a baby it smells like a baby johnny <laughs> the witch was eating cat food with a cigar in it Ugh. some of this stuff was just now you know why i picked it as the bad film this is definitely oh, a man. bad film I loved her friend, though. Uh, her voice is... I don't know who she is, but she's been on a lot of stuff. I can just tell from her voice. Uh, you know her friend that's kind of like the, the high-pitched uh, mm -hmm. voice? She kept making uh, Alice Beasley. I don't... She, Hildy? Yeah. She, she was in a lot of... Uh, she's been in a lot of stuff. I don't know how many things she's been in, but her boyfriend comments were pretty great it's kind of like my my sense of humor whenever we make girlfriend jokes but uh she's like talking about him she's like kind of reminds me of my last boyfriend <laughs> when she sees the statue yeah uh crawled up in a ball i think she makes a comment there about yeah <laughs> that looks like my looks looks like my last boyfriend crawled up in a ball um yes. she was the voice of miss Allardane Grotke, the teacher from Recess, the TV series. Yeah, 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 I can see that, yeah. And then, yeah, you're right. I mean, she hasn't done... She's done a lot of stuff. Like, her resume is huge. It's all yeah. shorts, TV series, animated TV series, that kind of a thing. She was in Maniac, I think, the Netflix series. Yes, she was. I haven't... Yes, yeah. she was. Um... Let's see, Biker Rumple Stiltskin. I thought that was kind of funny, amusing. Um, just the fact that he got on a Harley and called it his steed and rode it was uh, 
kind of enjoying to me. Definitely gave me a good chuckle while everything else in this film just made me cringe. Yeah. Dude, when he picks up the deputy female and just throws her effortless, effortlessly through that window, <laughs> I laughed so hard. And Nicole <laughs> walks in and she goes, what are you laughing at? And I'm like, this little dude, Rumpelstiltskin here, threw that chick through a window. And she's like, why is that funny? I'm like, look how small he is. <laughs> look how big she is. There's no way. And he does he it could, so effortlessly. You could tell he was crouched the majority of the film because he must have been a lot taller. Uh, so like whenever they do a full body shot of shot of him, like mm-hmm. he's you could kind of like see who's going prone, not like completely prone, lying down on his stomach, but kind of to the point where he was doing crab walks, just sideways. Yeah. yeah, it was a yeah. He did not look as short as they tried to make him seem. Do you know who he is, by the way? Because this is a very interesting fun fact about him. I have no idea. Okay, so this is Max, and I don't know how to pronounce his name properly, so I'll probably butcher it, but it's like Grodenchik, Grodenchik, something like that. He okay. is the Ferengi from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Mm. Yeah, so the Ferengis are the bald, round-headed, big-eared, uh, wrinkly-faced-looking creatures, or aliens, right? And he's, he's the, the bartender. Yes. So he's played, I think it's like three different Ferengi he was Rom, he was the patron in Vic's Lounge, and he was the pit boss. But he had a pretty good run from 93 to 99 playing that character. And that was, where is, because this was in 95, so this would have been right in the middle of him doing those skits. Um, and they definitely, I agree with you 100%, they definitely make him crouch. Uh, because he's not, he doesn't appear that short when he plays the character in Star Trek. No, he's he's definitely not that short. They had to make him walk funny, and if once you notice that, it's kind of like, okay, why is he running like that? Why is he walking like that? Why? Yeah, like, oh, why did you make him? Because <laughs> they want him to seem short. Yeah, but you couldn't have just hired Warwick Davis? Like, you want a short guy? Get a short guy. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, Warwick Davis is an A-list uh, Hollywood actor, <laughs> while being a B actor at the same time. I mean, he's okay, I was going to say, more than this guy. giving him a lot I, of credit there. Well, I mean, you look at Leprechaun, and then you look at this movie, and there's a vast difference in quality of bad flicks. Oh, we're going to look uh, at Leprechaun very soon, and I Rick Davis was also on Willow. He's also been in a lot of yeah. very high high movies. He's also done Broadway. So I wouldn't – yeah, I would definitely classify him More as of an A-lister A-list. in comparison. But yes. <laughs> yes. When the, the officer comes by and he's like – Oh, you need to trust me. He's like, oh, I do trust you, but he could have been one of those kids on PCP. And this lady's like telling him about Rumpelstiltskin trying to steal her baby and everything. Just, I don't know, man. This movie. A little too far. There's no logic in this movie. This is a cartoon. This was made by Scooby Doo's creators. You're watching Scooby Doo. Don't expect much. I don't. I don't understand why Max thought it was okay to bulldoze that graveyard. Still, what the fuck, man? Oh, right, right. Because chaff is his weakness. Straw. He uh, he turned straw into gold. That's what. That doesn't make sense to me. Why was? Wait, sorry. Why what is you... chaff? What is chaff? Straw, apparently. Yeah, but how is bulldozing a graveyard getting him chaff? They, there was a uh, chaff that was on fire in there. Oh. Uh... Chaff is actually the seed. No, coverings. I missed. Yeah, I missed that connection there when he's bulldozing the shit out. I just, I was shaking my head like, really? What? Why? What the hell? Like, it's yeah. a graveyard, man. Like, what are you doing? Um. So, I got two more things. I got two more notes. That's it. And then we don't have to talk about this abysmal film. Uh, first one is, you can't kill him by running him over. You can't kill him by shooting him. You can't kill him by burning him. You nope. can't kill him by blowing him up. Nope. You just have to say my name, say my name. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And he's been decay. He was decapitated. He pull, rips his own head off. Yeah. He pull, puts it on another cop's throat. <laughs> That's how he kills him. That was, that was the dumbest <laughs> murder I've ever seen. Like, it, it wins. Like, the dumbest kill scene in a horror movie. Villain pulls off head and puts it on someone's throat. <laughs> and then... Um, my last note is Max can't throw for shit. Cause when he chucks that Jade at the end, it like, it looks the way they filmed it. It looks like it maybe went two feet and then rolled for a mile. 
and then barely plopped into the river. And that's it. That's all that I care about talking. I don't even care about the family picnicking and finding it. I don't give. There's no sequel, and there never will be a sequel. Would you recommend this film, Curtis? If people are drinking heavily and want to watch a bad horror film, yes, this is the drinking only time. Movie. Yeah, it's a drinking game movie. Like, I, yeah, I agree. Every time you hear a Renaissance comment, every time you hear a Sex in the City, a comment you would expect to hear from Sex in the City, every time you hear some dumb one-liner that's just a bunch of shtick, like you could definitely take a drink. Max is full of a lot of drinking references. So is Rumpel. Alone. Oh, Rumpel, yeah. Not for sure. Also, yeah. Hildy. Hildy, I mean, like I'm my like, boyfriend. Uh, if I had to pick favorite character, Hildy wins for sure. Oh yeah, she. She's she was innocent. The best actress. Very innocent. Didn't do anything wrong, in my opinion. Tried to help out. God, yeah. if anyone, I don't. You can't even blame the mom though. Um, like. She was just. She just missed her husband. So you can't really like blame her for. She didn't cause it. She didn't mean to. Um, I don't know. Sorry. Let's not dive back into that. This, this movie didn't make sense. It doesn't have to make sense. It's They made it. It was a B, B movie. I think they knew what this movie was when they made it. Yeah. I give it a very low rating. Two out of ten. Oh, man. That's pretty low. Low from you. I give it like a three out of ten just because drinking game. I like it. Well, that is definitely going to be the two films that we watched this week. Um let's see let's make sure we do all the social media things so um if you haven't already make sure you follow us on twitter and on instagram at two guys horror pod it's the number two guys horror pod on instagram and twitter um we tweet just about every day and we instagram from there uh i try to do it every day but uh we'll get better at it as we get used to it um don't forget to follow us on spotify if that's where you listen to us, but there are six total platforms you can ca- you can catch us on. Six different platforms. Currently, we're on Breaker, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Spotify, and just your regular old podcast RSS feeds. At two guys and some horror. Um, this is going to be episode seven coming out very soon. And again, that is horror, not horror. Uh, please don't bump us into that. <laughs> Cool. Uh, Well, if there's nothing left to say this week, uh, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. And um, we will see you next week for, drumroll please, The Changeling and House 2. Which is way better in house. I can tell you that right now. You think so? I know so. I don't agree with you. Well, let's fight about it. (laughs) We'll argue later. You all take care. Catch you later, guys. Happy, happy Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. <laughs> All right. Um, let's... Turn it off. Yep. Turn it off. Fuck, it's me. <laughs> All right, you ready? Yeah. All right, roll that beautiful bean footage.